What's going on everybody, it's Max here and today I'm partnering again with Paradox Interactive to bring you the next in our tips and tricks series for Stellaris. This time I'm going to bring you our top 10 tricks for intermediate players. By now you probably have a couple of games under your belt, you might even have your, your first win. But we are going to bring you the tips that I think are going to help you really solidify those victories, especially in the mid game and get those victories a little bit more often. Let's just jump right into it with number one. Now that you have a few games under your belt, you can better understand the various mechanisms that come together when you create a successful empire. So why not build one of your own from scratch? You can choose everything from what your species looks like to its history, its ethics, its traits, its homeworld, and more. My recommendation for min-maxers is to look up the current strong meta and choose traits, ethics, and civics that complement and strengthen each other. For instance, you can boost your technology gain by choosing the fanatic materialist civic, technocracy, and the intelligent trait. Or you could become a powerful trade empire by taking fanatic xenophiles, the merchant guilds, and thrifty. Just remember that your ethics and authority have limitations on what you can and can't do in the game. Fanatic pacifists will only engage in defensive wars, while spiritualists of any fervor will never grant AI the same rights as a biological species. And those ethic choices will also determine what civics are available to you as well. So be sure to read through the requirements of each civic if you'd like to use it with your empire. Number two, customize your ships. This is the feature that really solidified my love for Stellaris. Ships come in all different shapes, sizes, and capabilities. The game automatically designs a ship of each type for quick and simple construction, but your ships can be optimized for different situations by using the ship designer and overriding the auto designing of ships. Here, you can build ships using the latest and greatest technologies, ships that thrive in nebulas and pulsar systems, and even design ships to counter your opponent's ship designs. Pay really close attention to the pros and cons of each weapon, as these will determine what styles of ships will be really good against your opponents and what styles might leave you at a bit of a disadvantage. Don't forget that you can see the ship types of your opponents with enough espionage and intelligence level on your enemies. So make sure you get that by using the espionage feature in the game. Number three. What was that about nebula and pulsars, you ask? Well, every star system in Solaris is unique, not only due to the planets and the asteroids and the other objects you can discover in them, but also determined by the type of star and its position in space. Pulsars, neutron stars, and black holes all have adverse effects on ships in their system, including the defense platforms that you build in that system's star bases. Pulsars are especially interesting because they completely nullify shields of all ships and all defense platforms built in that system. So consider building ships and defense platforms in these systems with only armor. Stars can also exist within Nebula, a stellar phenomenon that blocks sensors from all ships and star bases outside of its reach. You can use these systems as really powerful choke point locations and lure your enemies into attacking you where it's most advantageous for you. Number four, managing your planets is the key to a strong economy in Stellaris, but we all make mistakes sometimes. If your pops just aren't working the right jobs, you can micromanage them by increasing and decreasing the available jobs on each planet. Remember that amenities on a planet really only need to be positive to gain the full effect towards stability. Extra amenities don't really have a much bigger effect. So if you have too many populations in the clerk jobs, but not enough working other positions, you can reduce the number of clerk positions in the advanced job view on the population tab of the planet. You can also quickly encourage pops to work a specific job by simply clicking on it in the simple jobs view. Just don't forget that you've done this if you need more amenities or a different job prioritized in the future. Number five, every planet has a variety of features on it that determine everything from how many districts of each type can be built to what blockers exist that are preventing you from expanding your colony. The features panel allows you to clear out blockers and make way for additional districts, but features can also enable you to mine strategic resources on that planet, including gas, 
moats, and crystals. These strategic resources will make it much easier to upgrade buildings on your planets to new tiers in the future, so definitely keep an eye out. Number six. If you find yourself short on resources, you can turn to the galactic market by clicking on any of the resource icons at the top of the screen. Here, you can buy and sell resources using energy as currency. You can even set up monthly trades to automatically buy or sell resources every month. The value of each resource in the market is based on the internal supply and demand of your empire. So expect the prices of minerals to rise if you buy a lot of them. Now, if you own the Megacorp DLC, Empires can compete to host the galactic market, and once that's been formed, the prices of goods on the market will actually vary based on the galactic supply and demand. So you could end up making a fortune by selling a rare or undiscovered resource right at the start of the market opening. Number seven. When you first learn about a new empire, you won't have a good idea of their relative strength, their empire size, or their intergalactic relationships. You'll gain this information over time, either by building a strong diplomatic relationship with them or through espionage. Assigning an envoy to build a spy network in their empire is one way to learn about their territory, their alliances, their strengths, and their weaknesses. In the base game, you can send your envoy on the gather information operation to temporarily increase how much you can learn about the government, the borders, and the fleet compositions of your target. But the Nemesis expansion adds a whole slew of options to secretly undermine your opponent's efforts. Just know that building a spy network in any government can lead to some tricky diplomatic situations. Number eight. Meeting your neighbors is one of the more tense moments in Stellaris. And while you won't know much about them at first, one of the most important things to know is what they think of you. Empires that spawn near you are more likely to be your friend if your ethics align with one another. And conversely, empires with opposite ethics are more likely to be your enemy. This is because having opposite ethics gives AI empires a negative impression of you, and it leads the AI to claim systems and go to war with you for them. You can see an empire's ethics in the upper left-hand corner of the panel by clicking on an empire's flag in the galaxy view, or by accessing them in the contacts panel. If you're boarded by a future rival empire, follow this checklist. First, make sure to close your borders to the empire if your first contact policy isn't set to already do so. Next, find a forward defensive position to use as a choke point and upgrade and build the defensive platforms on that star base and station your ships nearby. Make sure you're producing enough alloys to support a large fleet and to replace ships lost in combat. Alloys are produced at alloy foundries and in industrial districts. And lastly, especially on the alloy side, consider changing your economic policy from a mixed economy to a militarized economy. This will have a major negative impact on the production of commercial goods, but it will increase your alloy production in return. Number nine. If you want to expand your territory, you'll usually need to start and win wars. The easiest way to do so is by claiming territory and spending influence in the claims window. While you can claim systems during wartime as well as during peace, it's much more expensive to do so. Claims also cost more influence the further the system is from your borders, so you can't just claim every system in the galaxy all at once. While at war with another empire, your ships can attack enemy ships and star bases, and your assault armies can land on enemy planets to conquer them. You'll need to conquer all of an opponent's planets to remove them from the game. So keep that in mind when you're placing your claims. During war, you'll take control of systems by destroying your opponent's star base and by conquering every planet in the system using armies. But you'll only get to keep systems over which you have claims if you fully control the system at the end of the war, or in the rare case that your opponent surrenders. This goes both ways. So if your war ends in a status quo peace offering, each participant will get to keep any system they fully control at the end of the war, as long as they have a claim on it. 
Wars are waged for a variety of reasons, including conquest of star systems, the vassalization of a weaker empire, or even the total annihilation of an alien species. And each war has different rules for how claims and conquests are handled. So be sure you know exactly what you want from a war before declaring it, or you're gonna spend the next 10 years looking awkwardly at each other during your truce period. And lastly, number 10. Stellaris can be won. Yeah, I said it, you can win a game of Stellaris, so achievement hunters, pay attention. When you first start the game, you set an end year goal. This is the year that when you hit it, and only after the defeat of the end game crisis, your game will come to an end and a victory is determined. Victory in Stellaris is determined by the overall combination of your empire's strength that you can view in the victory tab of the situation log panel. Your victory score is calculated by how many systems, planets, and pops are in your empire, your technological prowess and your success against various galactic crises, the overall strength of your economy, and various other elements, including any relics found if you're playing with the Ancient Relics DLC. Ultimately, the goal is to create the most historically powerful empire by the year 2500, or whatever year you've set rolls around. And you can challenge yourself to achieve this in a ton of different ways. Try playing a completely pacifist empire that goads its enemies into wars they can't possibly win, or play as an all-devouring hive mind and just don't stop until you control every star system in the game. You can even create shorter games and challenge yourself to be the victor in a shorter period of time. Just remember that if you're going for achievements, and there are many of them, you'll need to play in Iron Man mode and without any mods. Hopefully with these tips, you'll start to see your gameplay improve. If so, you can start challenging yourself against tougher AI or even participating in multiplayer games with other players. One of the best ways to learn Stellaris is by playing other players and seeing what they do, just like the ones you'll find here on the official Stellaris YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you can see more content like this in the future around Stellaris. And if you're looking for some really in-depth tutorials for the game, you can check out my own YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Max the Catfish. Until then, see you next time.